Okay, hi everybody. Um, welcome to this conversation with the three filmmakers from No Cut Film Collective. Um, they are, they're the ones who made the film Rifle in a Bag, which I'm not sure if all of you have checked it out, but I highly recommend that you go and watch the film and then come back and watch this conversation or maybe listening to this conversation will encourage you to watch the film. But it's an absolutely cannot miss film at the festival lineup. Um, it's about, um, a character called Somi and her husband Sukram who fell in love and um, they were part of the Naxalite movement uh, and then they surrendered themselves as part of a program where um, if you surrender yourself to the to the police you are allowed to live in some kind of a community but it's uh, so much like a gated kind of closed community where you're not you're in a limbo situation you're not integrated into normal societal life and you're not part of the guerrilla movement anymore and the film really looks at this life in flux in a way, um, but also um, narrows it down to a primary struggle um, of trying to get a caste certificate for the trial of uh, the fighters, but also of the ex maxillites but also really through a really simple struggle, trying to understand how systems are so divorced from people's lives and um, just the idea of what is a nation what is nationalism? What is the place for the for the citizens of that nation within it? So what I really what I really felt moving about the film was the way in which it, it is an unusual portrait in the sense that the character of the film and the character of the person it's trying to film uh, really allow for space for each other to exist. And I think it's really nice that um, the filmmakers have managed to do this. Uh, we're going to just get into a small conversation to understand how this sort of unusual way of filmmaking. Um, happened. I understand that the three of you all are from a collective, which was, um, which uh, I will let me introduce them. This is Aria Rote from Puna. There's Isabella Rinaldi from Rome in Italy. And then there's Christina Hans from um, Romania. And uh, the three of them sort of became friends when they were at uh, film school together at the Doc Nomads. And I think it's, um, one of, I mean, I kind of think maybe we can ask them how it grew from there and um, what what the film collective is all about. I just want to know, like, uh, did you all start making films together when you all were in college? Was it always a kind of long term plan? How did it happen? Okay, so I can start. So I mean, we we did met in uh, we did meet in Doc Nomads, and I don't know if you know, like uh, Doc Nomads is like a mobile film school, so we would move from one one country to another for two years and make films together. Uh, I think I can say for all the three of us that uh, even before Doc Nomads, we were already into films. Uh, some already into documentaries. Some of us were more into fiction or this sort of things. But then we, all the three of us already knew that we wanted to pursue documentary filmmaking, creative documentary filmmaking. And therefore we applied and we were lucky enough to be in the same edition and meet because Doc Nomads has one edition per year and the classes are like around 20, 25 people. So we were quite lucky to manage to be in the same year. And we bonded as friends, but also as uh, uh, filmmakers. Like we realized that we had very similar uh, cinematic sensibility and we started collaborating on our students' film while in the program. And we were quite determined already since the beginning that we would continue working together. And that's kind of what we did. We give ourselves a name, which is No Cut Collective. And the first thing was that Christina and I, once we were finished with the master in 2016, we went to India and started researching for the film. So why did you, why did you guys think of uh, making your film in India? Um, as opposed to any of the other countries that you all are from? Well, I think it, uh, yeah, I think it, it was also a matter of uh, uh, realizing uh, that, okay, first of all, uh, both of us were really uh, triggered by India from uh, Arya's uh, stories. Mm -hmm. And then uh, more practical, <laughs> uh, because it was uh, much more complicated for Arya to, to come in our countries. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, concerning all the visa issues. And um, so we, yeah, we wanted firstly to, to work together. Uh, we decided uh, for it to be uh, India based on these reasons. 
And uh, so, yeah, after three months of uh, research in India, we realized that, um, yeah, there was, of course, after meeting Somi, we uh, decided on, on making uh, this film uh, and we were very determined to continue it no matter what. But we also had a chance in these three months to understand India uh, a bit. Uh, we were like, it felt like really living in India for three months mm -hmm. as we were living with Aria and uh, we were, you know, having a normal life in India. So uh, yeah, it, it allowed us to understand that uh, we could manage uh, to, 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 to make this film because India is uh, quite friendly, <laughs> despite, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, believing that it would be chaotic so, and hard to manage. Yeah, yeah, but, but India is also so um, massive and so uh, complicated and, you know, it's, um, it's not really one thing in a way, right? So I'm yeah. curious to know, you had this, I, you had this friendship, you had this sort of common aesthetic and vision and you know, came from the same place in your intention of filmmaking and you thought, hey, we want to make a film together. So you all come to India to do that. But did you already have a sense like, oh, this is where we're going to look for to make this film or, or were you just waiting for it to find you with the faith that it will, um, you know, how did, what happened when you're, was it just like a holiday or were you thinking of different ideas that you're interested in and, and trying to sort of sniff out a film when you met Somi? So mm -hmm. really, um, it was not just a holiday. I think we had very much decided when we were studying together that we would want to pursue this. So uh, when Isa and Christina came over and then we started looking for it, we were researching anything that was around us that was kind of in a way linguistic wise accessible to me, language wise accessible for me. Mm -hmm. So we were mainly um, traveling in Maharashtra and we were uh, really going to different places that are absolutely not touristic, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, we basically decided to meet uh, my uncle who lives in Garchiroli, who is also the doctor in the film. Mm -hmm. So we thought that we would meet him and then uh, see what he what work he has been doing there so that was our main intention when we went there and while exploring that region and that small village we uh, stumbled upon this settlement of surrendered naxalites and then we met somi and then like isa christina said it was like a, we have to do this kind of a moment for us yeah yeah so tell me about Somi, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure there is something, of course, very special about her, There's something very powerful and very um, moving about just the person that she is. And I'm sure that's something you'll have encountered when you all met her. And perhaps that's why you all had this determination to make a film. But how was it with her? Was, was she, uh, I mean, um, was she from the beginning quite comfortable with the idea of having a film? What? what are the ways in which she and you together spoke about and built this film um, and, and the way in which her story would be told? What was that process like? Okay, let's do it in order. So, I go. Uh, so as you said, yeah, we were quite struck by her since the very first time that we met her. And like Arya mentioned, we met her once we discovered this surrender Naxalites community. And actually in that first time, our first research trip, we didn't film with her because we met her very late, like I think one week before we were leaving, but we did manage to film a little bit with other people living there, a little bit the space so that we could craft, let's say a trailer and apply for funds to describe a little bit the background story. But we were like very, very striking by her. And in this that first meeting, she, she was curious about us, but I don't think that she didn't think much of us because they've seen a lot of people, filmmakers, journalists, writers going there to hunt for stories, let's say. Mm -hmm. So she kind of put us in that same box and she was not that interested, I would say, in our presence. But then we were crazy enough to, and we told her that we were going to come back and she probably didn't really believe it. We were crazy enough to actually come back eight months after. And that time we went straight to her because we knew that we wanted to make a film with her. We didn't even know if she was going to be around because that community like, is quite unpredictable in the sense. Sometimes they're away for work or they move. 
So we didn't know if she was going to be there, but luckily she was there. And I would say that like from that very first moment, we went very blandly to her and saying, we want to make a film with you. We, we don't know also how it might turn out because we don't know you and you don't know us. But if you're willing to do this with us, we can see if it's gonna work for the four of us because of course it's a collaborative uh, thing also with the characters. And she kind of accepted to see how things would go. And then we took it from there. And month after month, the trust was built. And she understood what type of story we wanted to tell. She understood that we were not interested in her only as an Axelite fighter, but we were actually really looking to hear her voice. And uh, yeah, and then we made the film. Same, okay. wonderful. I just want to... Um, speak about two things that you mentioned. First thing, the idea of collaborative, not just between the three of you, but also the four of you. And I feel like this is something quite unusual. I mean, it's it should not be unusual, but it is quite unusual when you look at nonfiction filmmaking. There is a first of all, filmmaking itself has is over time become such a kind of hierarchical structure, right? It's a very pyramid with a visionary sort of director on the top, and then there's this crew who's trying to materialize the vision. And even in, in cases where directors work with uh, the same people over and over again, and they kind of all bring their own aesthetics and voice to the film, it still is very driven from the top. Um, and I found it, I mean, there are, there are a, for example, I don't know if you are aware of the Turup Collective here also in India, who does this very interesting collaborative form of nonfiction filmmaking. And I find that, there is a very uh, strong essence of that politics of organizing, which seeps into the film also, you know? Um, and I was wondering, is this exploring this, this structure of filmmaking, um, something that is common from the, from the tradition of film schools that you come from, because it certainly is not, I, I would say, in Indian filmmaking contexts. Is it common for you to have other contemporary filmmakers who also work in this collective fashion? Uh, that's one thing I was wondering about. And the other thing I was wondering is that it's not anarchy, right? There is a structure, even though it's not, uh, the collective also has a structure, but I would assume that one makes that structure up as you go. It's not a handed out structure. So how does, uh, how, how does one think about those structures in a way that every person in the collective is moving towards making a film that comes from a common place and yet has space because at the end of the day, we are also artists, you know, we are also makers. Uh, so how to have space for one's voice and also other voices, right? Um, I think all of you might have something or the other to say about this, so I'll go for it. So in terms of forming a structure as a collective, it also uh, stems. I would not be able to say that, okay, this is the way it should be done. I would rather say that this is the way it worked for the three of us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I, I would not generalize it. So I, what was there was a mutual understanding and a level of trust that can transcend your ego or your own... Uh, voice so I, I think that that really makes a difference that we did have our own assigned roles while we were making the film but all of us including Somi had a equal say or we were able to hear each other out while we were making the film and that in a way probably uh, gave rise to a rifle and a bag this collaborative uh, manner of doing it yeah, I mean, coming uh, for sure what you said about the, uh, how things work usually in the pyramid of the hierarchy in filmmaking uh, put us off from the beginning. And we were, uh, as we were also working together before, uh, we always, uh, I think each of us realized that the input of also editors and directors of photography and um, others that are involved um, is uh, so overlooked and so important and that it's uh, very much uh, collaborative works that uh, work that uh, then um, of course falls under the director. So um, of course this also uh, in a way, yeah, triggered us to challenge it uh, 
because we uh, yeah we believe that um, of course although we all have our own uh, voice or vision um, in this particular case also because we were working with Somi and uh, she was such an active and uh, powerful uh, strength in the filmmaking process. It's, um, yeah, it was a, a, a way of uh, giving out control, a control that uh, is also seen in the stylistic choices of the film. Mm. And it was very much about giving out control, which I think uh, is, uh, can be quite damaging. <laughs> And uh, it was, of course, an exploration in this sense too. We didn't know uh, if, what will be the result of it. Uh, but I think, uh, um, yeah, we were all very open to, to challenge this pre-existing structure. Yeah, and I think that like, uh, as I mean, both Christina and Aya mentioned, like I will take on two things. Like one, for sure, it's a matter that I mean, we did, I believe, I mean, as Arya said, it's a setup that worked for us. And I would add, it's a setup that worked for each film. Like we are quite fluid in this sense, like we are still working. We are now also producing other films and we want to keep this fluid structure because each film will need something different. Like if, I don't know, next year we make a film about, uh, I don't know, Arya and her mom, of course, it would be weird to have it co-directed, like in that sense, that space should be more intimate and it makes sense that one voice is more prominent. In this case, it worked like this. So it's about adapting, I would say, to the story. And regarding what Christina was saying, that it's an exploration and it's about giving away control uh, as much as, I mean, I think we all agree that like a director, as a filmmaker, an author has a vision that structures reality what I personally like very much about documentary filmmaking is this exploration. Is this is what the camera and the character creates together while you are there. So it does change and it should be given as much freedom as possible in order to bring out originality in the sense of not something peculiar, but something that is original for that moment that you're filming. And that sometimes is overlooked a little bit by I would say a bit egomaniac director sometimes that have to force what they imagine on a scene necessarily. And sometimes it works and it's very good filmmaking. Other times maybe you might missing something else. Sure, yeah. Um, I was actually telling Arya the first time I watched the film for me, it felt so much like the camera was just a very patient listener who didn't really have an agenda. who was just there, you know, sitting by the fire, sitting in the house just there to witness and therefore there was just so much more space to slowly understand and slowly seep in. But of course, apart from, and there is that magic of, of like you're saying, uh, allowing for what is there to evolve and that's the fun of documentary in a way. That's what makes it special. But as filmmakers who are aliens in a particular, uh, you know, you're not naturally part of that world and you are fixed there. And although you do spend long periods of time and people get used to your presence, your presence is still an artificial, um, you know, insertion, um, which is not always a bad thing. But I'm, I'm, and, and also as filmmakers, one tries to uh, sort of, if, even if it's gentle and not coming from a place of ego, but to nudge your story and to mold it in certain ways to really bring out the way that the things that you feel you want it to say or that has the potential to say. So I want to talk about one scene with this in mind, which is the scene of um, Somi and her son by the water. And they're having this conversation. And it comes quite after, you know, he's gone to school already and you see him kind of begin to get integrated with um, the mainstream understanding. You know, there's this, I mean, I'm sure that's a very magical coincidence that in the class they were saying all of these things. Uh, but but it is at the back of your mind, right? This child is going out into the outer world and we know what the narratives in the outer world are about people like his parents. And um, how did that scene happen? Was that something that 
uh, you know, you, you suggested to Somi? Was it something that y'all made together? Did you always know that this is, you know, this is some, this is the seminal moment that we want to have in the film? Just tell me a little bit about that. So, um, it was, uh, so over, after we met Somi a couple of times, like a few times, this conversation had come up where she was, she used to always say that, what would my son think of me when he understands or knows about my past? So it was the, how do you say, the seeds of it were somewhere there in, in her also. And for, I think the three of us, this scene uh, really, I mean, the way we imagined it, it felt like it could have a huge potential. So I wouldn't say that it was dictated to show me that this should happen, but there was a long conversation a conversation that extended over days where we were just trying to we we were also curious and she was also curious about it and then finding a way that how do we do it mm -hmm. and then filming it became a reason actually in a way for her to have this talk that otherwise uh, she was a little bit appreh apprehensive about so our presence actually being there while this was happening was one of the contributing factors to why she felt that okay let me start this dialogue with my kid now so uh, that's how it happened yeah and i think also the oh, sorry oh. the urgency for uh, her confession to her son came also because he was for the first time out in the world because he was uh, admitted in the school and uh, she she, of course, now didn't have control, again, the idea of control, about uh, what he will be told by, by this, uh, about this, about the, the Naxalism and about, yeah, uh, identity and nation. And so uh, she wanted to, uh, yeah, tell her son what are her ideals and, and uh, what, what actually uh, meant for her the decisions she took in the past that are very much affecting his life. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think she, when we told her, she, I mean, because we were having this conversation, we went to the school, um, she wanted it. And like Aria said, she was a bit reluctant. She took uh, a day or two to think about it. And then one day she just said, let's do it. And we went into the jungle, which is a setting that we wanted it to happen um, because, uh, because of course the, the Naxalites are operating in the jungle uh, and we had the intuition that uh, during, the, uh, during the, this confession, let's call it, um, somehow the space uh, from her story uh, would be, I mean, the space from the background, the jungle would become the space of the story that she's telling. So this was a kind of a, a feeling we wanted to achieve by choosing this space. And it absolutely works for sure. Um, and uh, another decision that you've made in the film is, you know, when there's this, um, kind of dead end that Somi is repeatedly facing when she's trying to figure out how to get this document for her son. <clears throat> and you see her meeting various officials, whether it's in the school or whatever. Uh, but we never, we always, you know, see it from the, like her speaking to a wall. We don't see who she's talking to, right? Um, is that uh, something that, um, is that, was that something that you shot in that fashion as well? Or was it something that retrospectively you began to feel like, okay, that's the way the style that we will uh, uh, create in the film where, where we don't see the faces of any of the officials that she's meeting for all of these reasons? Uh, no, okay, so I go and then if you want guys you add. Mm -hmm. uh, like, no, we did uh, shoot it that way, that way, like I would say the first time. And we realized that it was like a mix of intuition and then confirmation. It wasn't something that we have decided since the very beginning. It's something that happened the first time. 
and uh, we also had like the first time some shot of this official but we had one long shot of them like the first one that you see in the film and it worked so nicely first of all to be really with them and also it meant something that this the government would be like a faceless institution on one side to give it this like a uh, foggy shape in a way because they they don't know who can help them from the government like they see them as a faceless uh, yeah. entity and also in a way not to necessarily because we never wanted to make a propaganda film on any side yes. and like to keep this uh, uh, governmental entity more uh, blurred let's put it that way I think helped us in that sense not necessarily to put blame or to identify one specific officer or one specific office being responsible more as a a system that wouldn't work and it's not about one single individual it's about the general dysfunction that they face and then because i mean some is so they're so expressive yeah. it was more interesting for us to read their reaction than the one of the counterpart even though there were some very kind officers as i think in the film also is uh, is perceivable yeah. Yeah. at times how did y'all, uh, I mean, Isabella and Christina, uh, how did y'all manage without understanding the language as things were going, you know? I mean, I know, of course, you had Arya to be your ears, uh, but sometimes you also feel completely lost, you know, and, and to respond in the moment, to, to take decisions in the moment would, would be difficult. Uh, how did you manage that? Well, I mean, uh, the I think something uh, that we didn't say and it's quite important to know is that uh, we shot the film without any of us understanding what's happening in 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 the scene yeah. because they are uh, speaking Gondi and Madia, the tribal languages. So uh, we were in the same boat with in the moment of filming, the three of us. Um, and then, uh, of course, outside the filming, um, uh, the Arya could communicate uh, with the characters in Hindi and then with the rest in Marathi. And um, so, of course, uh, we were, <clears throat> uh, it was hard at the beginning, but then, of course, uh, um, you get, I don't know, a sense gets developed that you didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just uh, like, I guess, uh, just reading uh, emotionally or analytically, like what's happening in front of you. So it's hard to explain how, how it, it, it got developed and how it was, but like, of course it was a lot of communication with with uh, us two with Arya mm. and then just reading think, the other layer that is not verbal. Yeah, I think that in this, like the fact that the three of us studied together in Doc Nomads was a good training because in Doc Nomads we studied in Portugal, Hungary and Belgium. Mm. So like we all the three of us have been in situations and filmed already together languages we didn't understand, maybe none of us or just one so we did have a very agile way to translate things, not only language wise, but like also cultural wise, because maybe when Aria was in Europe, it was kind of the other way around. Like we would help her navigate some things that are not only language, it's also like cultural differences. Awesome. So we have that relationship already of knowing each other and knowing how you can read things and how, and we are faster, let's say, in filling the gaps for the other person. Yeah. And then obviously, yes, uh, we were a bit lost in some things, but then yeah, sometimes it's less hard than you expect yeah. to read situation, even if it's a, a very different culture, because the first thing was to understand some really basic things of in, in India that we couldn't even imagine. Yeah. So like it was, it's still, a, I mean, it's an ongoing process actually. Course, yeah. I, I have to say one thing though that there were many moments actually that uh, Isa and Christina were reading the situation exactly the way it was happening mm -hmm. irrespective of the verbal uh, communication 
it, it there were many like I used to think of it almost as an echo because Somi would be saying something and Isha or Christina would say something, and it was exactly in sync. And there were many many moments. So what these guys are saying is really really right that in that moment there are ways that can definitely transcend language, and you can find I wouldn't say like hundred percent clarity, but a connect and a deep connect. Definitely you can uh, find. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, I want to ask you all just one last question about this film, and then I'm just really interested to know what you all are doing in the future. What are your plans for your collective, and so on? Uh, but so you come to India, you find the story, you film here, you kind of stay for a longer period of time, and then how do you manage to bring the film together with three of you all in three completely different parts of the world? Um, how did you make up a system for that? A lot of Skype, <laughs> like, <laughs> a lot of Google Docs. It's a long distance relationship I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like now that COVID hit everyone and a lot of people had to work from home and do these sort of things. A lot of my friends were like, how can I work with someone through a computer? And we we're like, yeah, you know, we did it. <laughs> continents, so I think you can do it. Uh, I mean, it was definitely hard, like it was crucial, obviously, that the filming part happened together and we spent like two months, three months in a row. So a lot of the film, like we were, because it's also how we work in general, I would say, like a lot of the film happens already in the filming, which is a weird sentence maybe, but sometimes if your material is a bit weak, I'm not saying necessarily as a sure. thing, but like maybe if the material doesn't speak so much, you have to make a lot of the film in the editing. In our case, we did already a lot of film really in the filming. So the editing part was, I'm not saying easy because it wasn't, but it was quite much driven by, by the footage itself, also by the style of uh, footage we have. It didn't leave so much space for a very crafted editing anyway. And yeah, a lot of Skype, a lot of talk. So one of you was sort of handling the timeline and the edit and the others were kind of screen share viewing. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We worked uh, with, yeah, screen share with, yeah, showing versions to each other. And uh, sometimes we tried out different things mm. on the sequence. So, yeah, but it was like, like Isa was saying, like the material really, uh, Mm, in a way had one direction that we established it from from the shooting phase right yeah so it's amazing how you feel like you transcend language then you transcend <laughs> physical meeting now what next <laughs> <laughs> so but what is next what what are you are the three of you dreaming up a new film again together are you thinking of uh, making your own individual works you mentioned you're you're interested in producing now uh, tell us what you're up to and what your plans are for what's what's to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, considering the current situation, I think it would be quite difficult to make something uh, like we did with a rifle and a bag right now. Yeah. Uh, but even uh, before the, the pandemic hit us, uh, we wanted to collaborate also with other filmmakers um in different uh, roles let's say we are quite flexible on that but we are co-producing uh, now with other former colleagues of ours from uh, doc nomads mm -hmm. a film in nepal called no winter holidays mm -hmm. um so we are the co-producers uh, of the film and we, of course, in this, uh, it means also creative work. It means also helping uh, raising funding because we gained a lot of experience with a rifle and a bag, especially uh, in Asia, uh, funds that are uh, eligible for, for Asian projects. And uh, we work with filmmakers that for now, at least, uh, that uh, we've worked with before but we are also open to new collaborations. So um, yeah, we are uh, now uh, focusing on co-producing. Co okay, sounds, sounds very exciting. Um, 
Um, is there anything else you wish to say about your collective, about filmmaking, about Rifle in a Bag, um, before we wind up this conversation? Just one thing. We are co-producing two projects, actually. Uh, one is uh, in India and one is in Nepal, like Christina was saying. So the one is in India is also from uh, with a former Doc Nomad uh, guy. Mm -hmm. and so that's just that addition. Okay. So that we hope, let's say that we hope we could, because like, I mean, we were, of course, we will make other films, like uh, the thing is that we would want to be, to have the space and the relaxation to go research, which at the moment is something, it's a bit, uh, it's a no-no. Yeah, that's one thing that's that's impossible to do online, no? Yeah, yeah no, I could, that is the only thing we can do like that. And yeah, and also this year was like quite intensively spent still on uh, Rifle and a Bag to bring it as, much around as we could even if yeah it wasn't the best year to premiere a film but still we are actually we can't complain because we like some of the including yours like some of our most uh, dreamed festival uh, uh, got took the film so so we are happy yeah. nonetheless yeah except in another world you would have been in the mountains uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was kind of a uh, we were dreaming of the moment of uh, going uh, back to India and having a screening in which Somi and Sukram mm -hmm. and the doctor <laughs> and everyone who could be uh, joining us we we were uh, hoping to to meet them again with this occasion yeah. with the the premiere in India. So, yeah, it's a bit um, sad that it couldn't happen, but we yeah. hope that maybe we can organize another one later yeah. on. But has Somi watched the film? How did she feel about it? Yeah. yeah. Was the first one to watch it. Yeah, before anybody actually, Somi was the first one to watch it and she really liked it. Uh, she also, I mean, one of the biggest things for her was that it's, first a portrait of her as a mother and then as a surrendered next select, yeah. which is how she feels, which is how she prefers being portrayed also. So she felt it was quite true to that intention. Mm. So yeah, Sukram also liked it. They both watched it uh, together. Yeah, and also like I think one crucial thing that Somi said when she watched it, it was that she's happy that the film is how it is and that she took part of it because she hopes that other people will watch it not to know her story like not to know necessarily about Somi but to understand that there are many others in her situation and that this film might help people to look at them differently or at least even just to know that they exist yeah. because for, for I would say that for the most people that have watched the film that are not from India or that are not familiar with the Naxalite uh, issue it was really like uh, from another planet. <laughs> like, I don't think that they ever heard of it. Like us when we met her, so. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of Indians also might not know of this thing that exists in this way, for sure. It is quite unusual and it is also, um, um, doesn't really fit into the way in which this movement is usually framed when you look at it, you know, in the ways in which it's talked about in journalism or films or whatever. Um, so anyway, thank you so much, all three of you, for joining us today and for making this beautiful film. And we wish you all the best. And we really hope to see more wonderful work coming from your collective. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, selecting the film this year for the edition of the Inshallah. It really means a lot to us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>